Good evening, everyone. My name is Samuel W. Black. I am the director of the African American program at the Center to John Hines History Center in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We are pleased that you are joining us this evening for what we know will be a wonderful lecture and talk about She Took Justice as Gloria Brown Marshall would take us through this history of Black women fighting for freedom, fighting for their rights, using the law uh, and politics in finding justice. The Heinz History Center is a Smithsonian affiliate organization founded in 1879 that makes us the oldest cultural institution in the city of Pittsburgh. We are also the largest history museum in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. The African-American program, uh, which started around 1993, basically as an archive collection, but it has grown into a program uh, uh, that collects not only archives, but museum artifacts. We publish, we research, and we also do exhibitions and education programs. Speaking of programs, our next program is on February 23rd. It is our first installment of the From Slavery to Freedom film series. We will have a Netflix film entitled Blood Brothers, Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali, and our discussant of that film will be journalist and author Herb Boyd. So you may want to join us on February 23rd. That's at 5.30 p.m. Uh, and it will be virtual. You can find more information on our website, which will be HeinzHistoryCenter.org. If you have any questions or comments um, for the program, please put those in the Q&A and chat, and we will get to those after the lecture. Um, and speaking of the lecture, let me now introduce our wonderful speaker. Gloria J. Brown Marshall is a professor of constitutional law at John Jay College of Criminal Justice of the City University of New York. She teaches not only classes in constitutional, constitutional law, but race and law, evidence, and gender and justice. She taught in the Africana Studies program at Vassar College prior to joining the staff at John Jay. She is a civil rights attorney who litigated cases for Southern Poverty Law Center in Alabama, Community Legal Services in Philadelphia, and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund Incorporated. She addresses audiences nationally and internationally. And Gloria um, has spoken on issues of law and justice in Ghana, Rwanda, England, Wales, Canada, South Africa, and before the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland. Brown Marshall is the author of many books and articles. Her books include The Voting Rights Way, the NAACP and the Ongoing Struggle for Justice, as well as Race, Law, and American Society, 1607 to the Present, which includes chapters on race and education, voting rights, criminal justice, property, civil liberties and protests. Uh, the book she will discuss this evening is She Took Justice, which is about black women and the law from Warrior Queen in Zynga to today's activists. She is working on a documentary film titled She Took, Took Justice to accompany the book. So maybe she'll tell us a little bit more about that film so we can include it into our film series in the coming years. She is a powerful playwright and seven uh, playwright of seven produced plays. Her most recent play in process is titled Class, about the racial fight over the American dream. Her screenplay, Freeman's Men, is a finalist as well as official selection of national and international film festivals. 
She has been the recipient of several honors for her work with civil rights, social justice, and women's equality issues, such as the Ida B. Wells Barnett Justice Award, the Malcolm X Award, the NAACP Community Service Award, and the Wiley College Women of Excellence in Law Award. She is a member of the Dramatist Guild, Mystery Writers of America, National Association of Black Journalists, Penn American Center, Penn International, Society of Professional Journalists, Association for the Study of African-American Life and History, the American Bar Association, as well as Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated and the National Bar Association and the National Press Club. Brown Marshall is a Pulitzer Center grant recipient. She completed the New York City Marathon and is working on her debut novel, A Book of Historical Fiction. Will you please do give a virtual welcome to Gloria J. Brown Marshall. Thank you so much, Samuel. I appreciate it. I'm honored to be here. Um, the Senator Hines Center is one of great renown, and I am such um, a fan of not just uh, Pennsylvania, but of course of Pittsburgh and the Black community in Pittsburgh. There is there is such a vibrant community, and and I'm I'm glad to be here, even if it's virtually. So as was pointed out, um, my book, She Took Justice, The Black Woman, Law and Power, was um, one that I felt needed to be written. Uh, it is about Black women in power. And the issue of power is one in which uh, power takes many different roles. It plays many different roles in the lives of the woman of African descent in the North America we call United States, even before it was called the United States, there was a sense that um, of manifest destiny that God created um, this, this land for a particular people. That is still in dispute. It was in dispute then, it's still in dispute now. I want though to begin my discussion and my, my talk, and we're going to have Q and A at the end, and so I'll save plenty of time for questions. I don't. I want to go quickly through time, and and as was stated, it's 1619 to our modern time, but I want to start with our modern time and then go back to the earlier period to put it all in some type of perspective. This is what I mean. I am a legal correspondent in addition to being a playwright and many other things. And I cover the US Supreme Court, which means I talk about constitutional law issues. And we all know that at this point, uh, President Joseph Biden is making a decision as to who would be vetted and then put forward as a nominee to this nation's highest court to fill the seat of retiring Justice Breyer. It's been said many times during his campaign, and now he is president, that that seat will be filled by an African-American woman. So the question has been on the tips of many people's tongues, um, who will this woman be? But I would like, in, for those people who are questioning whether or not this, this African-American nominee, if that is what takes place, is, is one who has come from a long line of heroic effort, intellectual capacity and desire, ambition and integrity, as well as a spirituality that has sustained the black woman throughout this time period in this country, whether or not the person has arrived in the United States within the last five years, 50 years, or they've been here for hundreds of years, there is, the, something about the United States and the African American woman that has given her not just all of the obstacles that, that are beyond anything a man has endured, but also tested her as an individual, tested her womanhood, tested her sense of self. And the fact that this year in 2022, we could have a woman rise up to be the leader 
I would say, among jurists, because the U.S. Supreme Court has nine members, and it takes five of those nine members to create the law of the land. So is this woman going to be powerful? Yes, powerful because she's going to be on the court. She could be one of the individuals creating the law of the land, equal to the president of the United States, equal to all of Congress, but also because this woman in this powerful position is part of a legacy of women. I want us to consider this. Here in 2022, it was in 1622, 1622, 400 years ago, that Queen Nzinga negotiated a treaty with the Portuguese. This famous interaction between she and the governor sent to control the region called then Ndongo, and then uh, changed by the Portuguese to Angola. 1622, 400 years ago. I want us to think about how this whole process has taken place. And as I go forward, I want us to not only consider what it is that we want to do when it comes to our, our viewpoint on the rise, the ascent of this black woman to the US Supreme Court, but I also want us to think about from when she comes. And she comes from a place in a time in which black women, women of African descent, African women were kings and queens. African women are still queens in Africa today. Um, you don't hear about the royal lineage of African kings and queens today, but they are still in existence. And if you, uh, and when you see my book, and you'll see in the the opening pages, there's an image. This is an, an, an image of a statue of Queen Nzinga. To put it in perspective, you see me at the very bottom of the statue. Yes, that's me, and I'm a tall person. I am six feet tall. And you see how large the statue is of Queen Nzinga, the image of her in Luanda that's, that is placed before the Museum of War um, in the military. And this was during a trip of mine in April of 2019 that was part of the 400th commemoration of the arrival of Africans into the Virginia colony in 1619. And those Africans came from Angola. They had been part of what the Portuguese had done, which was foment violence in the kingdom of Ndongo. And some people have said that the kingdom of Ndongo might have been as large as New York and New Jersey. And Queen Nzinga, then Princess Nzinga, watched her father, the king, as he negotiated the egos, negotiated the, the economy, did everything the royal person would do who would come before him as a diplomat to make sure that his nation was run properly. And the, the heads of the different tribes would come and pay homage to him and have him settle their disputes. So she watched all of this. And at the same time, Queen Nzinga was watching her brother take lessons with the, with the, the weaponry of that time. And her, her brother was not really into all that was necessary for him to develop the skills to be the Angola, the Angola, N-G-O-L-A, which is the king. And so she would actually be so interested in how to use the, the sword and the spear and, and, and how to use the shield. She was the one who was taking these lessons privately, her father found out about it and said it was all right. If you can imagine a father at this time, I mean, she was born in 1583 during the time period of the arrival of the Portuguese into Ndongo. The Portuguese who arrived first in peace as explorers and then were given an edict by the Pope that they could, as Catholics, have dominion over all people and all land who were heathens. And so they came back with their full arsenal and little by little, they began to foment violence between those different tribes and tribal states. Little by little, they began to take the prisoners of war from those conflicts between the tribes and Princess Nzinga is watching this happen. Her father dies and when after her father dies, when her brother becomes the Angola, she realizes that he is not up to the task. 
he has very much um, given away the land, given away the power. And so she then sees that she must rise up using the diplomatic skills she's learned by watching their father, as well as the warrior skills she's learned by all of those classes that she has taken in these uh, private tutorials on how to be a warrior. Her brother sends her to negotiate a peace treaty with the Portuguese. This woman, this African woman is negotiating a peace treaty in 1622. And when she arrives in this very place that you are seeing here, when she arrives there, they tell her to sit on the floor. And this is a story I love to tell. These are the first stories in my book, She Took Justice. The first stories begin with the kings and queens. It begins with the fact that this queen would not sit on the floor before these Europeans as they sat on chairs in their robes, watching and laughing and smirking at her as she's there with her hand servants. And so she claps her hands, and the maid servants come to her. The maid servants who have oiled her body with the most precious oils have put gold on her wrists as she is this royalty. And then they sit and put their hands down on their hands and knees and allow their backs to be used as a stool for her to sit on as she negotiates this treaty. And it's from their backs that she negotiates the treaty with the Portuguese. And we know that they break this treaty. We know that people are being stolen, kidnapped from Ndongo, now Angola. And these kidnapped people are put on ships. And one of those ships, after a battle on the high seas, finds its way to the founding of or, or to the colony that was founded by the English in 1607. So we have this ship from Angola crossing the Atlantic Ocean with Africans inside of this ship as cargo. This ship is set out to go to Mexico. So I want us to think about the African diaspora as people were being kidnapped from Angola, taken to Mexico, taken to Colombia, taken along the West Coast to Belize and so many other places. And then this ship, because it was of English origin, was looking for an English port. They bypassed the Florida port because the Florida port was controlled by the Spanish. And at that time, there was conflict between the English and Spanish. They bypass the Spanish and they go to the Virginia colony because this is a colony that was founded by King James in 1607. And we have the arrival of men, women, and children, 20 and odd Negroes, as is jotted down in the journal of John Roth, who was secretary of the Virginia colony. And these men, women, and children arrive in 1619, August 1619. And I know many of you were part of commemorative events that took place in August of 1619 and during the year of 1619 and the great return of many of us to go back to the continent to regain our spiritual roots. And so it was then we also have the month before in July of 1619 that the lawyers come together and the other leaders of the Virginia colony and they create the House of Burgesses, which becomes a legislative body. These lawyers then create laws for the colony outside of the laws created in parliament. Now I had the opportunity and when I was researching this book to actually go to the archives in the House of Parliament in London to study what the laws were that were created in parliament and then um, enforced by those in the colony. The time period, as we know, trying to get anything done today even takes time, but imagine trying to get laws passed in the Virginia colony by ship. The issue would then go by ship to the House of Parliament. The House of Parliament would debate it, pass a law or proclamation of some sort, send that par parliament, um, parliamentary law or proclamation back to the Virginia colony. It took forever for these colonists to actually run the colony. So they decided they would create their own legislative body and that was the House of Burgesses. There were no slave laws then. There were no slave laws at this time. 
we, I always like to say, say that not only do we have these Angolans who are the first Africans and because there are no slave laws, we also have this indentured servitude in which we have white Europeans who are very poor and could not pay their way into this new world, which is what North America and South America were considered at that time. And Europe was considered the old world. And so you had the Portuguese, you had the French, you had the Spanish, and, as well as um, um, the, the, the many other smaller nations that like, like the, the nation of the, the Netherlands, uh, where you have these people who want to now have their like, rule, their power extended into this new world. And so they would go to this new world and say, we now take this land on behalf of the king. We take this land on behalf of the queen. And therefore, when you start thinking about the languages, think about where Dutch is spoken and the fact that I live in New York City and you still have um, in New York City, um, words that are left over from when, instead of this being New York, it was called New Amsterdam. And then the English came and, and fought the, the Dutch, and then the English took over and then renamed things. So there's a, a city in, in, in Northern um, England called York. And so we're now New York. There's an island off the Southern coast of, of England, Jersey. And so it's New Jersey, New Hampshire. And you begin to see how the influences of that time affect where we are today. But when we stay in this time period, we want to know that it was English law that said that if a person owned land, they could vote but no women could vote. No women could vote in England. No women could vote. Well, you know that back in, in England, they had a monarchy. So people did not vote for their leadership. But in this point in time, there were points of democracy where people were voting. So they could vote in the colony. But what about these Africans? The initial Africans, some of them were indentured servants like the poor whites who were under contract to work a certain number of years. And then after that contract ended, they would be free to start their own farms and be free to vote if they had land. The political rights, those political rights are the rights we're talking about now. What are the political rights of the Africans? Some of these Africans were um, considered um, perpetual servants. Others were considered indentured servants. And Mary and Anthony Johnson, um, an African couple, Mary and Anthony Johnson, had land of their own, they had servants of their own, European and African servants of their own in the 1600s, Mary and Anthony Johnson. And we know this because they had a fire on their farm. And I believe that one of the um, jealous white farmers, jealous that Africans would have this property, that they would have European and, and African servants set fire to the barn. And when they set fire, when that fire took place in the barn, it also meant that they could not pay their taxes. And so they had to ask, the Johnsons had to ask for a tax abatement. And that's why we know the Johnsons existed. There could have been many other Africans who also had land and farms, but because they didn't have an interaction with the legal system, there's no legal record of them, even though the census shows that there were Africans there in different levels. And so Mary and Anthony Johnson then become this part of our legal history, but Mary, Johnson is there. Her name, of course, was not Mary at the time when she left Angola. His name was not Anthony. What the Catholics did at this time, they would take, kidnap under penalty of death, Africans, have them hostage in a church, baptize them into the Catholic faith, change their names on the roster, put them into these slave ships, force them by gunpoint to go to these places around the diaspora. We now know there are people of African descent, where we know there are people of African descent. And so their names were Portuguese names when they arrived, and then their names changed again and became anglicized names, Mary and Anthony Johnson. Mary and Anthony Johnson, if we could have had the political rights because they had the land to vote. But they started in the House of Burgesses to pass harsher and harsher laws until finally Mary and Anthony Johnson were forced out of the Virginia colony and in their place were slave laws, perpetual labor laws. And these perpetual labor laws 
went into place. Also, African women who gave birth to an English, uh, a child by an Englishman, that child would have the status of the mother, not the father. Under English law, there was no slavery. An Englishman could not enslave another Englishman. Even though the word slave itself is actually from the word Slav that we know comes from Eastern Europe. So slavery was not just an African um, practice. It was not just a European practice. We, we know that slavery goes back, if you want to say so, through um, the time period of the Egyptians and the Israelites. It goes to the time period of the Romans and the Christians. There have been enslaved people. What was unique about English slavery and its practices in this institution was the barbarity of it, the barbarity of it. And what I mean by that is that these women were not only giving birth to an enslaved person in veto. So whatever the status was of that woman, that child would then have that status. If the status of the woman was enslaved, then that baby is born enslaved not based on some crime, not based on something, anything other than that was the status of the mother. And by 1705, we have chattel slavery, meaning chattel, movable property. So people of African descent were seen as property. This is the barbarism. When you go to some other um, institutions of slavery that took place, a person maintained their name. Many times they even maintained their religion. In this instance, the religions were taken away. The names were taken away. And they were then put into the sense of being no better than livestock. This was very different. The barbarity of the, uh, the English um, form of slavery is very different. Something else happened in 1669. In 1669, laws were passed that stated that a European who took the life of an African, that European would not face any type of criminal charges. That was a law passed in 1669. By 1680, and this is all in the Virginia colony, and by 1680, a law was passed taking away the right of self-defense, which meant that no woman could protect her child. No mother could protect her child. No husband could protect his wife. These were the laws that would pass during the time period in which this country was settling in and deciding based on this royal prop called tobacco that was so labor intensive that both men and women would work as Africans and equally in the field. So you had black women working as servants in the home, but you also had black men and black women working in the field. In many instances in other institutions of slavery, and I'm not saying it's good to be enslaved in these other ways, but I'm just talking about the barbarity of this enslavement that the women were treated just as the men. And on top of that, when women were sexually assaulted and giving birth to their children, those children became enslaved on as soon as they took their first breath. But at the same time, things were happening because women inside, and I always like to say that these women kept a sense of self deep inside. And even when they were treated as chattel, they still maintained their own dignity they still maintain a sense of self. I want us to, to think about in maintaining this sense of self that they had to decide on a spiritual form of religion. And the spiritual form of religion that they had before had been taken away. They kept aspects of it, but, they, but many of those parts of their religious beliefs were, were taken away but they kept a sense of spirituality. And at the same time, they were being baptized into Christianity. However, it was thought that Africans did not have souls. Native Americans who were already there in that landmass called North America, the Powhatan Native Americans were on that landmass and had been there for probably a thousand years. And yet here we have the arrival of the Europeans. The Powhatan Native Americans had their own governments. 
They had their own hierarchy. They had their own leadership. As I said before, the um, Angolans and the Africans had their own government. They had their own structure. They had their own leadership. They did not need the European to come and teach them how to be leaders, how to have a government, how to be so-called civilized. They already had their civilizations. In my, as in my um, aspect of this, the Europeans were the barbarians in that they came into these people's homes. And even though they were treated as friends, they were treated as people who um, were visiting, decided to turn on the Native Americans, turn on the Africans, and then treat them as heathens, use um, more advanced weaponry to take women and men and children into slavery. Despite all of that, or even in spite of all of, all of these things, the African woman continued to survive. Yes, they said you could practice religion, but because you have no soul, it's just a matter of practice. You cannot be converted to Christianity because no African could be a true Christian given the fact that Africans had no souls, that Native Americans had no souls. Yet we had spirituality. And I want you to consider the spirituality that was held inside women that continued with us when we get to the aspect of women and religion and, and the, the sense that yes, we practice the, their, you know, the form of spirituality, um, but we also practice Christianity and other religions as well. I want us to think about the political role when we think about um, someone by the name of Wentworth Chaswell. And Wentworth Chaswell, and I, it, it was the first known African in America or African in North America to practice politics. We know that he ran for office in 1768, that he became the constable of Newmarket, New Hampshire. And so we have our first African, we, we could have others. As I said, um, it depends on what we're finding. And, and I would say people need to delve into their archives and find out more about you know, their African ancestors. But we know that Wentworth Cheswell existed. We know that there are plaques in, about him in Newmarket, um, New Hampshire. And so this sense that the, the political was always there, but the rights of, of people who are um, of African descent were more privileges in many places. And so when we get to um, 1787 with the drafting of the US Constitution, we have women who are watching um, the debates around the Constitution. We have Mumbet who's watching in Massachusetts as these men are debating their, their rights. And she said, wait a minute, I have rights as a person I should have rights under the Constitution. And so she gets a lawyer and she sues for her freedom. And she sues for her freedom and wins. And this is someone who not only sues for her freedom and wins, but she then decides she's not going back to enslavement. She's going to be paid for her work. And she changes her name to Elizabeth Freeman. And Mom Bet, who becomes Elizabeth Freeman, said, you know, if, if she only had one minute of freedom and then she would die. She would take that one minute of freedom if it meant that that was the only minute on earth she had as a free person. So we have women of African descent who not only have their spiritual bearings that sometimes they have to hide, they also have a sense of self-worth. And this sense of self-worth is something that travels with them no matter what the obstacles are because something very deadly happens with the constitution. And it was meant to be, of course, um, a, a, a compromise between the abolitionists and the slaveholders. But in 1787 within the constitution is a slave provision, a fugitive slave provision. It also, within the constitution, it, it says that if, if someone runs away who's enslaved, they must be brought back but also within the constitution in article one, the slave trade ends. That's what it states, that a slave trade will end in 1808. Slavery continues, that was the compromise. But as far as kidnapping people and taking them across the middle passage, men, women, and child in the hold of slave ships where they could not stand up, where you had feces and menses and vomit and in the dead um, shackled to the living, all of this taking place and, and women 
who, you know, it, while they're in that, that horrible condition, some of them have babies in their arms. And some of them, when their babies are, you know, because they're looking at these babies thinking, well, we can't do anything with these babies. So they would throw the babies overboard. And these women would jump overboard after their children. These are the things that would happen that these women had endured. And so the, in, in Article 1, Section 9 of the U.S. Constitution, it states the migration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by the Constitution prior to the year 1808. Here's the problem. Now, the Americans, because at this point, we are now the United States of America, the slaveholders have decided if they cannot import more enslaved people as the growing nation needs more labor, then it would create labor by breeding babies through breeding black women like cattle. So they would have their own babies that they could create. And then these babies would then being enslaved with their first breath would have to work for that slaveholder. This is the barbarism that continued from the English into the American system. This is what many women of African descent had to withstand living on these plantations. The fact that these women could have killed these babies, could have taken their lives themselves, this could have happened, but they decided that they would live. And even though many of these babies were forced on these women, these women loved the babies anyway. But then what happened? The auction block. And many of these children were sold away. If there was a gambling debt of the slaveholder, the baby was sold away to make the money to pay off the debt. If it had been a bad crop that year, families were broken apart, individuals sold away. But what were women doing, the African women? They were running away. There are cases, many cases, that went before slave courts. In these many cases before slave courts, and slave courts were not like regular courts. Slave courts were more like tribunals. And these slave courts would have African women who were fighting for their freedom using law. They realized back in the first case that was brought in 1654 of Elizabeth Key, who she was one of the first um, mulattoes who said, well, my father is, is English, my mother is Black Bess and African, what is my status? It's after she won her case back in 1654 that they decided to change the law that any African woman who gives birth, the status of that baby will be the status of the mother. That was back in 1654. All these things happened in the Virginia colony. So what we have now are women saying, I can see how this law works. I can see how the law works. And because the law works against me, I'm gonna study it and figure out how I can have it work for me. So these African women would then run away and go to states that were not slave states. And then if they were brought back, they would say, but I was in a free state and therefore I am free. And these cases are cases that I have and she took justice. These cases, and there are hundreds of them, I just have a few of them in which you have women who are taken into free states. But these slaveholders who take them into free states think because it's against the law, you know, for enslaved people to read and write, it's against the law. These enslaved people could have an ear cut off or finger or foot if they were found or have their lives taken or they could be whipped you know, on their bare backs with a horse whip because they were found um, reading or learning how to read and write. They could be killed and their bodies left hanging so everyone could see this is what happens if you, you know, learn how to read and write. But they learned how to communicate anyway. And so there were African women who would then escape 
or they would be brought into free states and the other Africans would tell them, if you're in a free state, now is the time to run away. Because if they brought you into a free state, you are now free. And so this would happen time and time again. And so you had female fugitives. And I talk about female fugitives and the women in court, um, in slave courts. And I think it's also very important for us to understand the, the wickedness, and I, and I talk about the wickedness of, of these court systems where when there were people like Nat Turner and there were two women who were involved in the 1831 Nat Turner rebellion and that rebellion in which um, 54 whites were killed, not all by Nat Turner, but by his group. And there were African women who were enslaved who didn't join with his group, but they when, they, when Nat Turner's group arrived at their, at their um, cabins, then they said, oh, thank you, you know, we're, we're going to be free. And so they started acting a certain way, like, oh, I'm going to be free. And so unfortunately, Charlotte in the trial in which she was one of those women, because she outraged the slaveholders when Nat Turner was captured and the other men with him were captured, they went to Charlotte and say, how dare you be happy? How dare you act, you know, and joyfully. You should have protected the lives of your slave masters against these men who attacked us. And so these women were murdered because they actually wanted their freedom and were happy by the fact that Nat Turner had arrived to free them. These stories and, and many more are stories that are taking place in which the trial court system is one in which that they would actually have a tribunal to decide whether or not this person had violated the law of slavery because slavery is the law, freedom is the crime. So they would actually say that these people are accused of violating the laws of slavery. That would be the charge against them. And with that charge, they were found guilty. Nat Turner, for example, was hanged on November 11th 1831, I want us to consider the fact that not Nat Turner's confession to this crime, that he believed that God said he should rise up against the slave masters in Virginia, Southampton, Virginia in 1831. I actually traveled to Virginia and with a friend who's a former, no, he was actually a park ranger then, he's a former park ranger now. It was so dark. There were these high grasses no street lights. The only light was the light of the moon and the stars. And I thought about them, this group Nat Turner led, traveling across from cabin to cabin, house to house, attacking the white slaveholders. How they could see their way, the adrenaline they must have had to make their way through the dark. They traveled so many miles in such a short period of time. And I was there with this park ranger. He and I both decided we had taken back roads to get there, these one lane back roads. So when another vehicle was coming, you had to decide by flashing your light who was going to pass whom because it was only one lane. And I thought about Nat Turner. I thought about these women and the ideas that must have come through their head thinking that this finally is my time period of freedom. And then to be told later, how dare you defend yourself? You should have defended the white people. You should not have been thinking of yourself as a free person. And yet at the same time, in these 1800s we're talking about, we have the rise up of women like Sojourner Truth. Sojourner Truth brought different lawsuits, four different lawsuits. Her little boy, Peter, and this is in upstate New York, her little boy, Peter, had been stolen, even though, and Sojourner Truth stood six feet tall. Sojourner Truth, as we know, is, is um, the woman made famous when the um, Seneca Falls women, white women, got together and wanted their rights in 1848 with that Seneca Falls Convention. She is the woman who, um, Sojourner Truth, um, who in 1851, when these white women were, were, were meeting at a convention in Akron, Ohio, said, ain't I a woman? Famously, infamously, some people have said that she did not say that, but the speech did have those feelings behind it. 
in the end, what we know is Sojourner Truth walked away from slavery. She was in upstate New York. New York had already ended the slavery that they had. Sla enslavement in New York was this um, way in which um, people had certain rights, but they had gradual freedom. And so she had worked and, and said that at this time she was free. And when she walked away from freedom and she said this, so Derna Truth was asked, did she escape? She said, no, I walked away in broad daylight. I did not escape. And she didn't go that far. She was close enough for the slave master to come and knock on the door where she decided to go and say, no, you should come back to me. And she refused. She refused. These are the types of women we're talking about. Sojourner Truth refused to go back. She stayed with a white family. The white family ended up paying $10 for her and her son, Peter. However, because there's no paperwork, remember the constitution just said that um, these people are free. However, one of the practices was to come and steal, kidnap black people and sell them into slavery in another state. You only have your word to say that you're actually free. That's what happened to Sojourner Truth's son, Peter. He was kidnapped and sold into bondage. Sojourner Truth got him back. She investigated, she looked she asked questions. She was known then as a preacher in upstate New York. She found out where her son was and got him back. They had to go to court. She sued the man, the white man who had stolen her son, who had kidnapped him. She sued and got her son back. That was just one of the many lawsuits she brought. I want you to think about the fact that they had defamed her name and she brought a defamation suit. A defamation lawsuit is a suit that's brought when someone tells a lie, either in writing or by word. And they had lied on her and said she was part of, of this situation in which somebody had died through um, some religious practices that were taking place um, in this cult type um, environment you know, this very religious environment. And they blamed it on her because she was black. And she said, wait, I had nothing to do with this. And so they, they, they sullied her name. And so she brought a defamation suit and won the suit. I want us to, to think about um, the fact that we have um, black women who were bringing lawsuit after lawsuit, whether or not it was in um, slave court, as it was called, or um, they were being brought as defendants, or they were bringing lawsuits in civil court, they were making their way. They were saying that I am a person and I have rights. At the same time, as Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, and the suffragettes who are Black women, who have decided they're tired of trying to get these white women to have them uh, have them be a part of the white female suffragette movement and decide that they're gonna have their own suffragette movement. And so there are many of these black women who begin their own movement for the right to vote. And there are white suffragettes or white suffragists who decide we're not going to support the black men's right to vote. The civil war comes Frederick Douglass says it's a, it's a ballot or the bullet. The right to vote is so necessary. We have black women who are saying, if the right to vote means so much to white women who have rights, then think how much it means to a black woman who doesn't. And so the war comes, the civil war in 1861 through 1865. When the war ends, we have the 13th amendment, which gives it abolishes slavery, but also gives the rise to the use of the criminal justice system because even though slavery is abolished, except as punishment for a crime, slavery is abolished except as punishment for a crime. This then triggers the black codes. These laws that were put in place to um, incarcerate black people who are just gained, who have just gained their freedom so that these black men, women, and children can work as servants and rebuild the South. These men, women, and children are worked as criminals paying off their debts to society. It's women and men and children. 
who are part of this convict lease system. The women are being used as servants in the homes of white people. These are people, women who are incarcerated for trumped up charges who are then used as servants, incarcerated servants in the homes of white people. The South is being rebuilt from Birmingham through to um, Louisiana, to New Orleans and through Florida and Georgia, the South is being rebuilt with slave labor. Only this time the enslaved labor is incarcerated labor. Black women continue to fight for their right to vote. However, as suffragettes, however, in 1868, when we have the 14th Amendment, which gives citizenship at birth, that's what that first line in the 14th Amendment gives, citizenship at birth, equal protection, due process, the rights that must be given back because earlier, about less than 10 years before that in 1857, is Harriet and Dred Scott. Harriet Scott, we know the Dred Scott case because the Dred Scott case took away the political rights of Africans. Those same Africans who had been there since 1619 and before in Florida were not considered citizens, not able because they're not citizens to bring a case in the court of law. And they're told that their rights and our political rights are only privileges, are only privileges. They are not rights. And they can be taken away when any white person decides it and they have no rights a white man is bound to respect. So when we get to 1870 and black men gain the right to vote, this causes a schism again that's widening between black women and white women. Why? Because white women believe that they should have gained the right to vote before black men. But we go forward with black men with this right to vote and the black men, over 4,000 of them are in political offices. So we have black men who are US senators, black men who are in the House of Representatives, black men who are in the in the post offices, who are lieutenant um, governors, who are in the state assemblies. We have all of these black men in office. And also we have the creation of Howard Institute or Howard that becomes Howard University. And we also have the Howard Law School. And it's from the Howard Law School that we get our next person, the first black female lawyer, Charlotte Ray, in 1872. 1872. That's our first black female lawyer. When we're talking about black lawyers today and the rise of this, this black woman, if she does um, is allowed, if she does go through the hearing process, we know what happened with Merrick Garland and how they, he was cheated out of a hearing. If she is allowed to go through the hearing process and she becomes the first black female justice of the US Supreme Court, I want you to understand our first black lawyer, Charlotte Ray was in 1872, a graduate of Harvard, of Howard Law School. And Howard Law School's dean was Charles Hamilton Houston later on, who became the, the later on um, with Howard um, Law School, who's the one who so famously becomes the dean of that of, of Howard Law School and becomes the mentor to the likes of Thurgood Marshall. So we know that it's been a long time, this natural progression of the black female lawyer, that this is not something that happened overnight. And we this 1872 is just a few years after the first white female lawyer. So that we have um, Arabella Mansfield, the first white female lawyer. And that was in um, 1869, 1868. Um, so what we're, we're seeing here on the heels of that first white female lawyer is the first black female lawyer and many other black female lawyers who are now graduating from Howard. And as they go forward, we know that there are many schools now called HBCUs, um, historically black colleges and universities. Um, we have Spelman, which is a school that's established for black women alone. We had, we had colleges even before the Civil War ended, before that um, um, Howard, because we had Wilberforce and we had a black woman, McGrew, who attended Oberlin in the 1850s. And what we know about um, McGrew is that she was on the ship with the Amistad ship 
with with Sinke, the, the same ship that was taken over by Sinke, and then um, it found its way to New to Long Island Sound in Connecticut. And uh, once again, there was a trial there. The, the case went all the way to the US Supreme Court. It was argued um, by John Quincy Adams, and it was found that Sinke and all of those men and women who attacked their white captors and killed three of them, that it was an act of self-defense. The question before the court was, how can property act in its own self-defense? The court decided they are not property. They are people, and therefore, they have the right of self-defense. Remember, the right of self-defense had been taken away under law in 1680. It was recognized in the case involving um, the Amistad. As we go forward, I want us to consider so many of the female lawyers that then give rise to um, the, the long history of women in the law. One of the obstacles in someone like um, Sadie T.M. Alexander is a very famous um, first female um, attorney in Pennsylvania. And there were, each state had, of course, their first um, black female attorney. She's the first black female attorney in Pennsylvania. And the, the obstacles they faced were obstacles of race, but also of gender. Charlotte Ray had a very difficult time having a practice of law. And many of the times she could not afford to be uh, in sole practice of law because the men, men, black and white men, would not come and retain her services. And Sadie T.M. Alexander faced the same issues. Uh, she was one of the first um, black women to get um, a degree, a higher degree in economics. She was brilliant. And yet she had a difficulty maintaining, she had difficulty maintaining a practice of law. Um, and this, this, the sexism and, and the racism faced by black women was something that was, was pretty constant. And they continued anyway, because as I said before, from that time period, even before Queen and Zynga was a sense of self of a spirit that was not going to be denied, even going through the horrific throes of enslavement and all that that meant for a black woman. Um, I want to have time for questions. And so I'm going to go a little faster and go to Shirley Chisholm. Shirley Chisholm is the first black woman candidate for president. She puts her candidate forward in 1972, but in order for her to be this known figure as the first black female candidate for president of the United States of a major party, because there were black women who were candidates um, for other parties, the socialist parties and other parties before this. Also, the first woman to put forward a candidacy for um, president was Victoria Woodhull. And she did this also in 1872. 1872, Victoria Woodhull, a, a white woman, puts forward um, a candidacy for president and she asked for Frederick Douglass to be her vice president. And so the white suffragettes you know, shunned her, many of them, because they thought that she was trouble. They didn't like the fact, of course, she was embracing Frederick Douglass because these women um, were looking down on African-American women and at the same time wanting equality from white men. So Susan B. Anthony being one of those women who was a suffragette who did not embrace Victoria Woodhull, but she is the one who is thought of as the first um, woman to run for president of the United States. Um, one of the uh, candidates or one of the first women to be a judge um, of African-American woman is Jane Bolin. And Jane Bolin is in New York City, a judge, and she was born in 1908. She died in 2007. And I really wish I had the forethought to actually meet her, to actually find her, seek her out. Um, but she was from New York City and Jane, Jane Bolin was in family court. Um, as we go forward, and I, and I want to say one more thing about Shirley Chisholm. Um, Shirley Chisholm ran for Congress. The only way she could run for Congress in Brooklyn, because Brooklyn, even though it had the largest um, Black population above the Mason-Dixon line, it had no Black representation in, in 1968. 
and they had to bring a lawsuit. And I can honestly say um, that the, the joy and honor I have in saying that my mentor, um, Jocelyn Clopton Cooper, was part of that um, lawsuit that was brought in 1968 that challenged the districts in Brooklyn. And those districts were set up and gerrymandered in a way in which no matter how large the black population was, a gerrymandering or the dividing up of the, of the lines of districts were, was put in place in a way in which no black representation could be had because the voters would never have enough of uh, votes to gain access to the candidate being their candidate of choice. And so um, what we had with Shirley Chisholm was a lawsuit that was brought, a class action lawsuit that was brought, that lawsuit, um, Cooper versus Power, then led to another class action lawsuit that redistricted Brooklyn and then allowed for Blacks to vote for their own representative. And that representative was um, the first uh, Black woman congressperson, Shirley Chisholm. And 1969, who then becomes the first Black woman candidate of a major party in 1972. And one thing that Shirley Chisholm said was, I have a brain and a uterus, and I use both of them. I have a brain and a uterus, and I use both of them. She's also known for her phrase, unbought and unbossed. Um, as I go, um, to, in, in order to have enough time for questions, I'm going to quickly go to Constance Baker Motley. And Constance Baker Motley becomes the first African-American female federal judge in 1966. She too was in New York City. She was a civil rights lawyer. She is one of the lawyers that trained and became a part of the legacy of Charles Hamilton Houston, who was dean of the Howard Law School. And then he trained many others like Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall and Charles Hamilton Houston were leaders of the NAACP um, legal committee, which is what it was called under Charles Hamilton Houston. It becomes the um, NAACP legal defense fund under Thurgood Marshall. And Constance Baker Motley works under Thurgood Marshall in the New York office. Constance Baker Motley is also the first Black woman to argue a case before the US Supreme Court. I, I want to, to end there. There's so much more I could say. Um, I, I focused on the political at this point as we see we have our first Black vice president, Black female, Black, black um, vice president, Kamala Harris. We have so many Black women who are qualified as judges to rise to the nation's highest court that this is a, nat a natural evolution for a Black woman to be on the court. Um, and at this point in this time, 400 years from the time of Queen Nzinga negotiating that treaty with the Portugal, this is the time and we're making history again. I believe this year we will have the first African-American female justice of the United States Supreme Court. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, wow, uh, take a breath. <laughs> so much information um, uh, from the uh, 17th century to the 21st century on this path of justice uh, seeking uh, for women of African descent. And um, I do want to remind um, our friends online that if you have a question or a comment, please put it in either the Q&A or the chat. Um, as you can see in the chat, there are a lot of uh, thank yous and uh, 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 remarks about the uh, how wonderful the presentation was. Uh, so I, I, you know, will start us off uh, with a couple of questions. Um, first, um, in this early colonial American period, um, uh, and as each colony begins to legislate laws as to freedom and unfreedom. Um, how, 
how did those, as those laws were passed, how did it really impact um, the slave community? Because the, the majority of people of African descent um, during this colonial period were enslaved, although they were free people as well. Uh, there were people who were never enslaved, but who were free. And I think you pointed that out. Um, um, but can you talk a little bit more about how that impacted uh, Black women and their relationships in the slave community, uh, as well as their relationships just under slavery, period? I, I think that one of the things I'm, I'm looking into is how we kept that sense of self. What were the parts of our community that, that meant the most to us? And we know we have traditions, we have families, um, we have our own um, you know, type of families, families that are created. And maybe that's why our friendships mean so much to us to this day, because we had to create family out of friendship. We had people who were unfree and we had people who um, might have, and I, I'm assuming they did have, um, women who were meeting, um, trying to figure out, just like Harriet Tubman, how are we going to escape? One of the things that they would do, some of the tactics that, that happened during the time period of enslavement was that they wanted women to have babies because they knew that it would be very difficult to travel to escape with a child. And so if this woman was kept pregnant, not only is it giving more product for the plantation owner, more labor without having to pay for it, because once the importation and exportation of slavery ended, that then triggered this sense of how do we use the bodies we already have and make more product, make more laborers. And so they would have conventions in which they would talk about the best medical practices. We know that there were medical experiments performed on African women. We know that they, they sustained all of this and still had a sense of self. Um, I also think that um, when we think about the, the African woman under all these circumstances, and we consider the case of Margaret Garner, for example, who in, in, uh, escaped into um, from Ohio and had her child with her, and it was winter time, she escaped over the lake because the lake was frozen but they captured her anyway, they caught her anyway, and she killed her own daughter so that her daughter would not have to withstand enslavement as a woman, as a girl child, because she knew what it looked like. And I want us to talk a little bit about this whole thing about the person who's in the house and the person who's in the field, because it was always this sense of, well, the person who's in the house has it better. The person who was in the house was raped uh, constantly you know, this, this woman then was forced to have babies by the slave master and the slave mistress knew what was happening because the child looked like her husband. <laughs> and then at the same time, she would beat the, the enslaved woman because this enslaved woman gave birth by rape to this child. So it was a very complex, you know, um, dynamic of power in which these white women had no real power over their own husbands, but they did have power over the enslaved woman who was in the house. And so this enslaved woman in the house, and that was a, the, the situation with Mum Bet, would, would have to catch the fury of this, this um, slave mistress and the torture of, of any man, woman, and child of African origin who got in the way of this woman's temper. And there was nothing to stop her you know, from, from abusing enslaved people. And so stories are now being written about some of the things that these slave mistresses did to the enslaved people on the plantation. Um, but I wanna, if I could turn to um, one point, this is from my book, Race, Law, and American Society. Um, there, there's a, there's a, a, a part here that I just, I wanted to read. These are women who are taken on a slave ship and this is how much they love their babies. Um, when these women were taken on a slave ship with their children, when they were put us in iron, this is a quote, when they put us in iron to be sent to our place of confinement in the ship, the men who fastened the iron on these women, on these mothers, took the babies out of their hands and threw them over the side of the ship into the water. When this was done, two of the women leaped overboard after the children. 
The third was already confined by a chain to another woman and could not get into the water. But in struggling to disengage herself, she broke her arm and died a few days after a fever. One of the two women who were in the river was carried down by the weight of her irons before she could be rescued. But the other was taken up by some men in a boat and brought on board. This woman threw herself overboard one night when we were at sea. These were the types of experiences of these African women, those who were in the middle passage, those who survived, those who were part of enslavement. This is, these stories and so many more and the, in, the, in the cases that they brought. Now I want you to think about all this has happened to them and they see law cases, they see courts, they hear about these cases and they go, you know what? I think this law has something for me in it. Think about how brilliant, how creative. Think about the mindset of somebody who's saying, this law is what you're using against me. I'm gonna take this law that you have as a weapon and I'm going to use it as a tool for my liberation. That's just, that, that's what really made me spend 10 years writing this book because there's just so much that these black women did under such horrific circumstances. And that's why I always say to people, young, old, everyone in between, if they could do so much but so little and still have some sense of self, please don't have your sense of self based on a job. Don't have it based on an alma mater not based on how much money you make or what car you drive or what clothes with, what, that you could wear. Have your sense of self come from internally. Have a spiritual self because that can withstand losing that job, losing that man or losing anything else that's outside. These women had a spiritual self, I think that sustained them. And now it gives rise to what we're able to do in the 21st century. Okay, great, thank you. We have a number of questions in the Q&A and chat. Um, would you speak to the gender line during the civil rights movement, for example? What about Polly Murray and your thoughts on her and the dismissal of her ideas by Spotswood Robinson and then her elevation during Brown v. Board or even Black women being marginalized during the March on Washington. Yes, um, Pauli Murray is in my book. And, <laughs> and the case that, that I really highlight in my book that Pauli Murray was a part of, yes, she was very bitter by the fact that she should have been um, the leader of her class, her law school class, but they decided they could not have um, a woman be the leader of the class, so they made that person a man. And these are black men doing this to a black woman. Um, she was brilliant. She became an Episcopal priest. Um, she was one of the founders of the National Organization for Women. And she was also part of a law case um, in, in Alabama. And she was dismissed. And, and she could have been, if she would have, if, if that case would have proceeded up the, the court, the case was settled and it involved um, the restriction of women from juries. And she brought that case in Alabama and Lowndes County that had worked so hard to keep black um, men off of the jury and also had kept women, all women, black, white, otherwise off of juries. She was part of this case that was brought, that was on its way to the US Supreme Court when it was settled. But um, Polly Murray was a powerhouse. She was someone who had so much to give and like so many black women, and I'll say myself included, too many black women are not seen as be, being able to use their brain to contribute to the community. It's always, you know, black women are busy, not brilliant. And in this whole sense that we can be very busy, we can have all these different tasks to do. And it becomes um, really difficult as we stretch ourselves so thin that sometimes undermine our health because we're trying to do so much in the churches, in our communities, as activists, for our families. Um, and at the same time, the intellectual contribution that we could give is usually dismissed. It's rare that you find black women being sought out for their, for their intellect, for their ideas, for their artistry, but it's more of what they can do. They say, if you give a task to a black woman, expect to get it done. And so you have so many black women doing, but what about the black women human beings 
<laughs> instead of just doing being. And, and I think Polly Murray is, is one of these people in spite and despite all of her obstacles, she was able to contribute. But then the question always remains, why is it that she couldn't have contributed even more? Why is it that we are learning more about her now and she should have been known back then? There were so many Black women who led movements at the time. And if you had a chance to see the um, documentary on ABC, Women of the Movement, you saw Mamie Till. Mamie Till Mobley was somebody who was an activist at that time period. You also had many um, Black women there in my book as well, and I talk about them during the Civil Rights Movement, who were um, organizers um, in, in, the, in the communities in Alabama. Fannie Lou Hamer, for example, was because she didn't have a college education, she was from the South. She was looked down upon by the Black elite in the North and in New York City you know, at the NAACP offices. So there's been this conflict of class, this conflict of gender, um, but, and also we, we know this conflict of, of shade, of dark and light. All of these things have undermined what could be contributions made to make us even further along as a people and in community. This next question comes from our own uh, jurist, uh, Judge Cynthia Baldwin here in Pennsylvania. She says, thank you for sharing that exciting history I love the title of the book, Women Took Justice Instead of Being Given Justice. Her question is, in what areas will women of color be taking justice today? Well, once we get on the highest court, <laughs> that'll be one area. And, um, and I'll tell you later where I have this phrase, where this phrase comes from, she took justice. Um, where we are in corporations, we need to be higher up in corporations. We also need to um, see ourselves in Fortune 100 corporations as we then take justice there. I mean, we're in every aspect. I mean, think about how many Black female police chiefs we have. We now have a Black female police chief in New York City. We have Black female police chiefs in, in Philadelphia and so many other places. I think that in, in the arts, um, I, I was so proud of the sister who's who's doing the speed skating. I mean, here she is with a gold medal in speed skating. So, you know, we need to just look what, what we look at, we can do. But I want to say we need to take justice and, and continue to be about justice once we enter these positions. This is the new challenge, not just to have the title not just to have the gold medal, but what are you going to do with it? Because if you're going to be a black woman in a position of power and do nothing different than a white man would have done who was not going to um, benefit our community. And I'm not saying all white men will be against the black community. I'm saying those who do not have the, the, the community's um, furtherance and well-being at, at, at heart. And I've met some of these black women who care nothing about our black community. I've had conversations with black women in corporate America who only care about their titles, their positions. They're, they're, they're so afraid of being seen as black that they go out of their way to avoid interaction with another black person. So just because you're a person of color or a black woman in a position of power doesn't make me thrilled. If you're not there, as Charles Hamilton Houston said, as a lawyer, if you're not a lawyer about social engineering, then you're a leech on society. So when you think about Charles Hamilton Houston saying that, and Charles Hamilton Houston is the one who um, brought the cases that, that so undermined Plessy versus Ferguson, the case that gave us um, separate but equal, which was never equal, but gave us apartheid in this country in 1896. That case was decided by our Supreme Court. Charles Hamilton Houston fought against this and worked himself to death. He laid the groundwork for Thurgood Marshall to bring the case of Brown versus Board of Education. And Mamie is what Mamie Clark, Dr. Mamie Clark, is one of the psychologists who created the Dahl test that was used as part of Brown versus Board of Education. So all of these Black women doing what their job is, doing what's in their heart to do, but at the same time benefiting others and not just themselves. So if these Black women are only thinking about benefiting themselves, then basically they're a leech on society. We have another question. Um, would you provide some additional information regarding the current prison of women and the free labor system? 
as I stated in 1865, the 13th Amendment abolished slavery except as punishment for a crime. This triggered what we have now as a prison industrial complex. This is where it comes from because they saw that they could use the criminal justice system to incarcerate African men, women, and children, as well as other people of color, and then use their labor for free as incarcerated people under the convict lease system. So that included women. At this point, the United States has over 2 million people incarcerated. We are 5% of the world's population, and we have 25% of the world's incarcerated population. I don't know where this propagandist notion of the land of the free comes from, but it's just that, propagandist. And so here we now have, in this country, more incarcerated women than any other nation. Now, we don't know exactly how many people are incarcerated in Russia. We don't know exactly how many people are incarcerated in China. But based on the numbers that are presented, the United States has the greatest number of incarcerated women in the world. And so the disproportionate number of people of African descent who are men who are incarcerated, there's also a disproportionate number of African-American women who are incarcerated. And so we have to think about how that's going to affect their families, how that's going to affect um, those children who are now, many of them put in foster care. We wonder why there's just a disproportionate number of black children in foster care. We think about the undermining of the black family going forward. And to me, this is all part of the genocide. And yes, I said it, it's part of the genocide against the African-American community in which the, the sense that the African-American community does not need to grow that it needs to be limited because the power of the black community. Back, remember I said our first um, US Senator was in 1870, Hiram Revels was that first US Senator. As black men gained political power because no women could vote during that time period, black men gained political power. The backlash was the Ku Klux Klan the John Birch Society and different laws that were upheld by our US Supreme Court to undermine that political power. So the Colfax massacre of 1870s in Louisiana in which black men who had voted and were able to change the outcome of the, the election giving rise to President Grant, Ulysses S. Grant and others was seen as such a danger that by 1890 you had the um, use of the grandfather clause, the use of poll taxes and literacy tests that were part of the Mississippi plan. All these things were put in place in order to undermine the political power of the Africans. So by 1920, when black women gained the right to vote with other women, it was already thought that these black women who had laid the groundwork through their political organizing before they gained the right to vote had this power that had to be undermined as well. And throughout my book, I actually give the names and places of the black women who were lynched in this country. The number is not as large as black men, but many black women were lynched in this country. And many black women were put in institutions and their labor being used under the convict lease system. So there was an attack against black women because they knew that we had organizational skills that they had been shown by many of the black women leaders in the 1800s and early 1900s that became the groundwork to give rise to a Rosa Parks and the movements that took place in Alabama um, in the 1950s, 60s and into the present day. Okay, um, I have another uh, question um, uh, regarding the civil rights movement. I know that uh, one of the criticisms that um, people like Dorothy Hyde had uh, and others uh, on the organizing uh, of the March on Washington in terms of the leadership that the world would see. Uh, can you speak a little bit more to that uh, and the type of, maybe I'm wrong in saying this, but the type of sexism that existed in some of the leadership roles of civil rights leaders. Well, there was sexism um, among these black men. There was classism, um, regionalism. Um, we still looked at alma maters, not as much as we do today, which is ridiculous, but we looked at it back then. And this whole sense that um, these black women who were community organizers um, in, in the southern states were looked down upon, as I said, like um, 
uh, wrote uh, like the um, Fannie Lou Hamers, the Rosa Parks. Um, but I also want us to think about there was a time in which women, black women thought it was best to let the black man stand up, you know, to be the one in the leadership position, that he would be the one that black men, women, and other men and women would listen to. And they wouldn't listen because at that point in time, remember, white men weren't listening to their own women. So would they, would they listen to a black woman? You know, so there was there was a sense that these black women should take, I mean, black women should um, step back a little, but it was not thought that these black men would not allow them, that it was, yet yeah, we're conceding this because we understand the dynamic, but I don't think the black women believed that the black men would actually shut them out the way they did. That it was, I, I thought it was understood. I think they thought it was understood. We're doing this because we're all in this together. And strategically, it makes sense for you to be in a leadership position in this particular circumstance. But I don't think it was it was thought of that they would never then um, allow these women to step forward. And when the when the black women continue to be shunted out, and not just um in the civil rights movement, but in some of the other uh, more um, militant movements, the, the black women were not given the leadership positions they believed they deserved at the time. So this, this struggle around gender um, has been one that's, that's taken place. I'll tell you this, um, just to let you know that um, Booker T. Washington was asked before the, the, um, the women's um, gained the right to vote, whether or not he believed women should have that right. And he wrote an op-ed piece that was published in the New York Times and said no. So Booker T. Washington, who was the most famous black person in his time, was seen as the black leader, wrote this op-ed and said no, that, that, black, that women, not even just black women, that women um, did not need the right to vote. We have another question in the chat. Uh, that says, trying to understand how man cannot see humanity in a person different by race, religion, sexual orientation, or handicap. Then they go on to write the Declaration of Independence and Constitution and own slaves. What is your understanding of this soul deficiency? I, I think it comes when I when I talk about slavery, I usually talk about it, and I'll say it now from a standpoint of greed. Standpoint of greed. I look at it and say, here are people who um, are making money off of the backs of others. They're building homes, building communities, building businesses, and not having to pay the laborers. That's what we have that enslavement and then the past laws to say that if you don't work for me for free i can assault you i can kill you and there is no criminal consequence i want us to think about that when we're dealing with amir lock when we're dealing with you know tamira rice when we're dealing with trayvon martin and so many other cases like like george floyd we're still living with the vestiges of a society in which it was thought that we can exploit you to the highest degree, take your life, and then say, um, we shouldn't have any criminal consequence. When we look at Ahmed Aubrey, and these three men are confused, like, wait a minute, I, I thought we could kill black people and not have a problem because you still have a Kyle Rittenhouse and you know you still have your George Zimmerman slip through and, and get away with murder. But little by little, hopefully prosecutors will do their jobs and prosecute with as much zealousness as they do in police involved um, uh, civilian cases as they do on civilian on civilian cases. These um, framers of the constitution who met in 1787 in Philadelphia were not all slave owners. There were certain men among them, they were all white men, but they were not all slaveholders. So there have always been white people who have stood up for what was right. There always were some white people, even in the Virginia colony, who stood up, who tried to back off, but little by little, the crowd grew with the greed because people to this day, if they could have somebody work for them for free, and not pay them and beat them if they chose not to work for them, there are so many who would still do it. And there's so many people, if you ask some of our immigrants right now, there's so many people who are being treated in this manner, you know? And so if you can see if the law allowed it, then they were going to do it. 
white supremacy is was paid for through murder and laws that discriminated and it began before the constitution before the framers but the framers figured out how they could make it into a machine of commerce and that machine of commerce based on the exploitation taking the land of native americans killing them saying that god decided that the land should not be theirs because they don't deserve it that god decided that people of color should work for them for free all of that god is telling them and then create a law based on what they believe or lie them to themselves and say they believe that god said is theirs and this manifest destiny that is sometimes a mindset of people today that God says it's okay for me to do what I'm doing. God has blessed America in all of its diabolical nature of its past. The, the warts of this society, and I'm not saying everything about America is bad. I'm saying the warts, the bad parts, the history, all of that was in the making of this nation. And just pretending like it doesn't exist is not going to make the history go away. The same way that we look back on the, the attack on Pearl Harbor, we look back on the attack on, on the World Trade Center and the, and the White House um, during 9-11. We look back on those things to see and mourn the loss. We have to do the same things to mourn the loss of what was done in the past and learn from that past so that we can go forward in the, in the ideals of Sankofa. Sankofa from the Ghanaian um, is looking back at the past to understand our present and to make a better future. Great. Um, can you tell us about, um, you know, how can we get a copy of the book? You can get a copy of the book, I, you know, and I say this, I, I hope that it will be in the bookstore there at the Senator Hines Center. Um, yes, yeah, yes, order it now at the bookstore, Senator Hines Center. Um, you could also get it, and I'll tell you this, um, She Took Justice um, was published by Routledge, and Routledge is spelled R-O-U-T-L-E-D-G-E, -E, Routledge. If you go to the Routledge website and put in the code, I'm going to tell you, put in the code, I'm going to give, give away my secret code to get 20% off. If you put in the code F as in Frank, L as in Larry, R, 40, F-L-R, 40, then you can get 20% off if you go to the Routledge site. If you decide not to go to Routledge.com, go to the Routledge site, you decide to go to Amazon, then the book is there and in all the other places. But now that we know it's also going to be in the bookstore at the Heinz Center. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we have one more question. Um, person says, I am reading how to be an anti-racist, um, uh, Ibram uh, Kendi's book. And it talks about how changing policy today is the only way to move forward. How does knowing the history as those who oppose CRT suggest that we should help us to change the present policies? I, I had a, a, a colleague of mine who, white male, he read my book. He actually read Race Law in American Society. And he sat down and talked to me. And he said, I didn't know. I would hear these things, but I didn't know. And so the reason why I like the, the idea of using law is because we did not write these laws. These were laws that were put in place by others to maintain their superiority economically, politically, and socially. So since we didn't write those laws, we weren't the ones who did it. We can learn from it and learn what role we're now playing to sustain the vestiges, and vestiges we mean remnants, of that time period. So policy can change because I, I believe when we passed the, as we being the, the country, passed the 1965 Voting Rights Act, people died to pass that act. But we passed it and it made all the difference in the world because we gave rise to um, access to the political machine we call a democracy. The 1964 Civil Rights Act was passed that gave rise to women, all women, into positions of power. Through the 1964 Civil Rights Act that was created primarily because of the lives lost and the undermining of Black um, people in this country, we had the 1964 Civil Rights Act. The 1968 vote, um, 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 Fair Housing Act gave rise to equal housing. 
We take these things for granted now, but it's through national legislation that this took place. Is the society perfect because of those? No. Are we in a better place? Yes. Yes. And that's why we need national criminal justice reform national criminal justice reform. And that national reform should include the prosecutor's offices in which the prosecutors must take a tally of how many people are injured or die at the hands of police officers. And then under penalty of pro perjury, submit that information to the Department of Justice. This is what I want added to national legislation. And just like the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act and the Fair Housing Act, there will be changes in our criminal justice system one thing I want you to know is that our police department began as the very slave catchers, the very militia for, for those Native Americans who are rising up, the bounty hunters to go find and bring back people who had escaped bondage. That became part of the foundation for policing in our country. That is mixed then with the Bobbies from Boston and New York that stem from England, those come together to create our policing system. If you don't know that as a police officer, then maybe you don't understand that it was created for a them versus us. Maybe because I know people go into policing and they wanna go in policing to help people. They don't understand the um, culture that is at the, the core of policing in the society. And I'm not saying that every police officer is bad. I'm not saying that all policing is bad. I'm saying if you don't know the culture that you're entering into, whether or not it's a corporate, a corporate culture or a policing culture, an educational culture, if you go on campus and you have a new job and you don't know the culture of that campus, you don't know what they stand for, then you're in for a rude awakening and something happens within police departments. And going back to the George Floyd situation we're all familiar with, we know that there were um, officers of color who had only recently been on the police force within the first 48 hours, they were being trained by Derek Chauvin how to terrorize Black people. That's what he was showing these other officers. And they stood back and did nothing as he took this man's life. And now they are on trial. I want us to think about what would be a part of a system, a culture that could say, we have to show you people of color, you African-Americans, that you have no power within even your own community, that we can at any time, as they used to do on that slave ship, take the leader, kill the leader in front of everyone, and that would make the others cower. So they're taking someone like George Floyd, killing him in front of the others in order to train the community who has the power and then show these recruits, yes, this is how you keep black people in line. So the criminal justice system, as well as the policing system, so many of these systems have been put in place as a diabolical mechanism to maintain white supremacy. And if, if people of goodwill, and I said, there've always been white people of goodwill, who want to be a part of the solution, then they need to understand how they might unwittingly be a part of the problem. And they can gain that information through studying history. Ladies and gentlemen, the book is She Took Justice, The Black Woman, Law and Power, 1619 to 1969. We did put in the chat where you can order the book. 